done. Yes, ma'am. Every time one sits in the parlor, one must endure a bird crashing into the window. It's terrible, ma'am. See that you do something about it. What would you like me to do? Fix it, of course. Why am I the only one around here who takes it upon myself to fix things? Do you think that this is acceptable? Uh, no. No, sister, it is not. Do you know why your hair is not acceptable? Uh, no. It looks like the location a particularly mangy bird might choose to nest. Is this the kind of hair one wishes to have on the day the governess arrives? No. No, sister, it is not that sort of hair. What on earth have you been doing all morning? Oh, well, I was Don't just... Don't answer that. Is the extra room made up for the governess? Yes, ma'am. And is there more hen for tonight? Well, um... Why don't you ask the scullery maid? Yes, ma'am. Down. <laughs> Agatha? What is it? Why is there a governess coming? Hildegard? Yes? How have you still not washed your face? Oh, well, this morning... Don't answer that. <laughs> the cook is making more hen, and also there are potatoes, and also the scullery maid has the typhus. Again. <laughs> Ask her if she has any sisters. Sisters? If she dies, perhaps one of her sisters may replace her. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> See, this morning, I didn't have time to wash my face. You might as well be a wild animal. I was writing in my diary. You might as well live out on the moors with all the tiny, smudgy weasels. And I reached a good part. A good part? <laughs> of, um, my diary. If one is not writing sums and lists and possible strategies, then I do not know what one is writing. Oh, well, I was just Don't writing Don't answer <laughs> that. I've been nourishing the hope that since Father's death, you might turn your attention to more pressing matters. You're used to having everything done for you. Father spoiled you, Branwell spoiled you, but I have no intention of spoiling you, sister. Pardon me, miss. <laughs> yes, Mallory? The scullery maid has five sisters, two of whom are quite homely, two of whom are feverish, one of whom is bilious, and also there's a carriage in the driveway that's just arrived. Ah, the governess! Show her in. Yes, ma'am. Do you think the governess might be very pretty? Do you think she might like to read? <laughs> Perhaps she'll keep a diary. If she does, we shall break her of that immediately. Now, Mistress Agatha, Miss Holdy, may I present the governess? Why, hello, I'm so pleased to make your acquaintance. You must be Mistress Agatha, Mistress Holdy, Master Branwell. Oh, well, a dog, a very large dog, nice dog. Yes. <laughs> it is dangerous. Uh, yes. It is very large and very dangerous. You must never touch it. Shh. <laughs> you, I presume, are Miss Vandergaard. Oh, manners, pardon, yes. Emily Vandergaard, governess, in your service, I'm so pleased. What a long journey it's been, you must forgive me, I'm slightly scattered. <laughs> How was your trip, Miss Vandergaard? No, it was fine, no problems at all. A I'm long. delighted, we've been waiting for you. Yeah, I'm absolutely enchanted to be here. Did you come from London? Oh, well, I passed through it. How was it? It was very big. <laughs> <laughs> I'd quite like to see London. Miss Vandergaard has only just arrived. I'm sure she has no time to discuss London. <laughs> Sit. It will devour your face. Oh, that's dreadful. Has it always been so savage? Yes, always. <laughs> things around here are savage things. The moors are a savage place, and we who live here, despite our attempt to cling to a modicum of civilization, we often find ourselves forced to contend with savagery. Are you sure you're up for the task, Miss Vandergaard? Oh, oh no. Miss <laughs> Vandergaard. <laughs> well, I've been a governess many times before, if that's what you mean. I did send Master Branwell several references in my letter. <laughs> Master Branwell must be out at the moment, I imagine. He must be. <laughs> and the children have all, oh, well, <laughs> I do like to think they have felt tender affections toward me, but most importantly, Miss Agatha, discipline has never been an issue. Perhaps if Master Branwell is out on a walk, I might, or if he's with the horses, I might just, an introduction, or a friendly hello, or... I'm afraid that's not possible. Not, oh, of course. 
And Master Brando was very kind in his letters. He spoke very highly of his sister. Miss Vandegard, yes. dinner is always served promptly at six. One hopes not to be late for dinner. Will Master Branwell be at dinner? <coughs> <coughs> Master Branwell has been unwell. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's terrible. Master Branwell may not be at dinner. And the child? The child eats in the nursery with the maid. I'm so looking forward to meeting him. It is also dangerous. Pardon me? It is undisciplined. I said children of the Moors are undisciplined children. The maid will show you to your room. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Marjorie is the scullery maid. She's the typist, you know. Oh, no. <laughs> and the parlor maid is Mallory. She's with child. Oh, my. That will be all. Thank you. I'm so pleased, really quite grateful, to be in the employ of such old and well-bred ancestral home. Mm. Yes, yes, until dinner. This way. It will be many things, sister. <sighs> a bird drops from the sky, like a stone in the stomach, like all your happiness, fleeting and then gone. The gorse extends, the sky extends, many things extend. Happiness, I suppose, does not extend. I was once upon a time greatly satisfied. I believe. I do not remember clearly. I put my face against my mother's side. There was milk. I imagine this caused me satisfaction. I would not presume to call it happiness. There is nothing lasting in this world. Birds drop and drop. There are always more. The sky keeps spitting out birds, and birds keep dropping. In that sense, you might say that birds are lasting in this world, to which I would reply, it is never the same bird. <laughs> and this will be your bedroom. Parlor? It's your bedroom, ma'am. Uh, yes, uh, but you see, it looks like I see, yes, of course. Mistress Agatha asked to see you were settled. You look settled. Now there's dishes to attend to in the scullery. Uh, just a moment. Yes, ma'am. Uh, which maid did you say you were? I'm the maid. Your maid. <laughs> and you have the type of sort of everybody's maid. Yes. Yes, I do. Are you the one with the typist or the one with the baby? I'm both. <coughs> sort of both. <laughs> How are you both of something? Either you are something or you are another thing. When I'm in the scullery, I have the typist. When I'm in the parlor, I have the baby. Oh, it's how the time passes here. I <laughs> Well, that is one way of doing things. Indeed it is. I'm terribly sorry to hear about your... Conditions? I don't need you to be. Yeah, just a moment. Yes, ma'am. Uh, how long have you worked for this household? Oh, forever, ma'am. How old are you? I haven't been counting, ma'am. But uh, you were raised out here on these the savage moors. You were treated kindly. Uh, perhaps they took you to church on Sundays to hear their father's sermons. And Master Branwell said that you, <laughs> you spoke to him? In the letter. He wrote me a letter. Oh. What surprises you? Uh, nothing. I'm not surprised. You seem so. You seem greatly surprised. No, not I. Is Master Brenwell very frightening? Or are you frightened of him? You'd have to ask the Parliament about that. <laughs> <laughs> there you are! Yes, Forgive me for barging into your bedroom. I know you might want some time to refresh, but I just couldn't help myself. I'm okay. so excited you're here. Oh, uh, well. Thank you. I just know you'll love it here. The bracing air, and the strange thorny flowers, and the gorse. <laughs> and there are lots of long walks you might take, although there is the quicksand, and the large ravenous birds. And if you walk too far, you might get turned around and lost and starved to death, or you might even be eaten by something. But in general, the 
fours are very pretty. <laughs> Holdy. Just hold me, please. Holdy. It sounds so wonderful how you say my name. Uh, can I ask you something? Anything. Is this my bedroom? Of course. <laughs> uh, yes. But does it not, I mean, does it not look very much like the parlor? Does it? <laughs> And Father's Parsonage is just down the hill, and Agatha and I still do enjoy going to the sermons. It'll be such fun to go together, to sit side by side. We can share a hymnal, we can share gloves, we can share shoes. I have a diary. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, a diary. I keep one. Well, that's lovely. It's very exceedingly private and personal. I shouldn't like to tell you what I write in it. I have a very active imagination. Hmm. Master Branwell, is he also a man of God? No, I wouldn't say that. A uh, kind man, would you say? A gentle one? Do you keep a diary, Emily? <laughs> May I call you Emily? I don't keep a diary, I'm afraid. <gasps> That's too bad. That's just too bad. But you might start. I might, I suppose. You might start tonight if you wanted. I'm not much of a writer, I have to confess. Oh, but it's not hard at all. I can help you. Oh. What you do is you start with a header. Monday, for example. And then you just write down what you feel. And then, when you have a different feeling, you write down a different header, like Tuesday, for example. <laughs> uh, but you can't just start a new day whenever you like. Of course you can. That's how time works out here. <laughs> oh, well, that's very helpful, I'll consider it. If you don't mind my asking about your brother, you might write about London. You might write about what it was like. And yes, I suppose I could. And then you might read it to me. I hear in London, one gets murdered. Murdered? Most <laughs> brutally murdered, I've heard. Would you describe your brother as a gentle man, do you think, Holdy? My brother? Yes. Describe him. For example, he had a very nice hand in his letters. Did he? A very gentle and well-formed hand. That's nice. And the words he used were educated ones. There's a lot of time on the moors to become educated in one thing or another. But I imagine your brother went to study somewhere. London, perhaps, or France. <laughs> Studying. Master Branwell was not. Studying was yeah. not. Just like a boy, white. I imagine. He preferred lively debates about the law and dances, perhaps. Hmm. I'm so looking forward to meeting your brother and, and the child. It'll just be such fun to have another person here, <laughs> one that one might talk to, to sit by the fire on a lonely night and just... I might read you a page or two of my diary. That would be necessary, I'm sure. <laughs> it's very vivid <laughs> and upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> I might uh, no, a page or two or a chapter. We should both. Ready for dinner, don't you think? Oh, well, indeed, I should before dinner. <laughs> the pursuit of the ephemeral, there is joy in it, to be sure. Your fingers close around the thing. It eludes you. You desire more. More eludes you. Frustration and ecstasy are nearly the same sensation. Whole religions are based on this. Also, it appears, relationships. God? Hello, God. <laughs> this is called prayer. I talk and you are silent. Whole relationships are based on this as well. Uh, 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 I hate this. You. Oh, flying, it's the worst. It's you. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's you. Do we know each other? You look like a moorhead. I am a moorhead. Are you God and also a moorhead? <laughs> this is a very circuitous line of questioning. I'm confused. I am a moorhead. I hate flying, it makes me queasy. I hate landing, well, no, I hate the takeoff, and I also hate the landing. But the actual bit when I'm in the air, albeit brief, is not as hateful to me in general. Uh, what were you asking me? Are you God, or are you a moorhead? What is 
God. Or did God send you? No, nobody sends me. I make my own decisions. This God, it lives in the sky. Did you see him on your way down? Is it a very large bird? I don't think so. You know you saw it fly over? Oh, no, he lives there. The father of my house knew him intimately. Were you going to eat God? No, <laughs> no. I just want to talk. I don't understand you at all. Oh, wait. What is it? What do you think of happiness? Uh, what now? Happiness? I don't know what that is. It's this thing, this feeling, like a clench, like a fist, like right where your heart is, but further underneath. It hurts, and then it's gone, and then you want it again. So, indigestion? I don't think. <laughs> Not exactly. Like in the winters, when there aren't enough berries or seeds or anything, really, and the clench knot in your stomach area hurts, and then spring comes, and there are berries and seeds and bugs, <gasps> fat grubby grubs, and it goes away? No. Oh, and no. <laughs> wait, wait, what? I just want to oh, talk. You're very large. You look very large. You look like perhaps something that might eat me. I don't intend to. But you admit that you are very large. I guess so. <laughs> well, there you go. I'm very lonely. You're what now? Lonely. It's that thing, that fist, that clutch in your stomach, except this time it doesn't go away, and you don't want it. You're hungry, and I'm small, and I think I should go now. Well, that didn't go very well. The more swallow all the sounds. We don't even hear our own intentions after a time. We're just filled with the sounds of things getting lost. Dinner is very spare. <laughs> Most things here you'll find are spare. Oh no, not at all. I'm sure it's not what you're used to. I don't mind it in the slightest. But it sure is nice to sit in the second sitting room after dinner. <laughs> you so rarely use it. <laughs> Isn't it nice? Are we not in the parlor? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the second sitting room. Oh, oh, you've been all over, haven't you? <laughs> it must be so wonderful to have seen all the things you've seen. Uh, I been employed in many houses, but what one sees does not change so very much, I've found. I've never seen anything. Mallory? Yes, ma'am? Are you using the good teacups? Yes, ma'am. And why is that? Company, ma'am. Miss Vandergaard is not company, Mallory. She's come to stay with us. She will be part of the family now. Yes, ma'am. That would be all. Not Marjorie. Marjorie is the scullery maid. Mallory is the parlor maid. Yes, but in actuality, <laughs> that's what not is it, Marjorie? I said to inform you all the cups have been broke, ma'am. <laughs> broke, Master Brandon. Ah, uh, yes, I see. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Never mind. That will be all. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Grand after dinner diversions in the other houses, games and parties and desserts, perhaps? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> what kinds of things did you do? Uh, nothing special. Sometimes I sang a song or two when the children asked. <gasps> Could you sing us a song now? Well, I wouldn't like to impose. Oh, might she sing us a song, Agatha? Might she? It's just silly, Miss Holder. Your sister wouldn't want to be bothered with it. Why don't you sing for us? Yay. Are you sure? In your letter to Master Branwell, you expressed your particular love of music. I have to imagine you're quite good. Are you not quite good? Has Master Branwell mentioned that to you? Are you good or are you not good? I'm fairly good. Fairly? I'm quite good. I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> I should be delighted to oblige. When I was a child, I felt as a child. When I was a woman, I felt something new. When 
which you accepted. Perhaps accepting them was your fault. Either way, in your time on the moors, perhaps you will become more knowledgeable. What am I doing here? Pardon? I came at the request of Master Branwell, and yet I find he is dead. I'm here to look after a child that I have not met, and that you seem in no hurry to have me meet. If I am not here for Master Branwell or for the child, then what precisely is it for? Do you wish to leave? 
It was a question. No one is a prisoner here, Emily. If you wish to return to London and seek yet another poorly paid position in yet another syphilitic household, you have only to repack your trunk. It was only a question. I didn't quite hear you. I am not eager. Well then, more tea? <laughs> Excuse Would me? Would you enjoy more tea? Mallory, my brother was a rageful man, so there's that. He broke the teacups, as you have heard. Other things, too, were broken. Dolls when we were younger. Eventually a neck or two. He had his way with a maid on multiple occasions. With Marjorie? With Mallory. But in actuality, oh, Master Branwell was not a prudent man. Were any of the letters from Branwell? Perhaps the first. What did it say? It notified me that my advertisement had come to his attention and that his household was seeking a governor. Oh, yes. No, that was still myself. <laughs> and the poetry and the description. You did like them, didn't you? How can you stand there before me and admit to writing things of such a nature? If they were badly written, that would be another matter entirely. But none of what you received was badly written, don't you agree? Badly written or not, it was shameless. shameless. A woman, a woman Miss Vandergaard, desires results. A little girl desires approval, maybe. But a woman desires efficient results. I desired a governess. I wrote to one. She quit her immediate position and she came to me. Like a bee to a flower. Is that not efficient? Is that not what you would call a result? And now that I am here? Now that you are here, you should rest. It has been quite a journey. And your intentions and the reason? You were right. Excuse me? Your song was more than passable. Mallory, please show Miss Vandergaard to her bedroom. Yes, ma'am. But good night. <clears throat> <laughs> ah, you. Oh, this? Well, <laughs> if you insist, but just a little bit. My diary is very private, you see. But since you asked so nicely. <laughs> but I must warn you, it is very, very sad. <clears throat> Monday. I am very unhappy. Tuesday. It is bleak. And I am unhappy. <laughs> Wednesday, there was a fog, and my digestive system was disagreeable, and I am greatly unhappy. Thursday, there was a driving rain on the moors, and a governess arrived, and she has beautiful hair, and when she says my name, it sounds like a song written just for me. I think we shall be best friends, and closer than sisters. Friday, the governess doesn't seem to keep a diary. It's hard being rather well known. I wouldn't say famous, but somebody else might. <laughs> Every time I go into the village, Everyone says, there goes the parson's youngest daughter. They say, I wonder what exciting things she's thinking about today. They say, I hear she's a famous writer. And one doesn't like to be talked about so much. It makes one feel quite uncomfortable. So I say, <laughs> oh, stop. There's nothing <laughs> special about me at all. I'm just like you. And they just refuse to believe me. They think I'm special. They think it's so very evident when they look at me that I was destined for wonderful things. <laughs> Even if I can't see those things myself, it is so very evident <laughs> to every last one of them. <laughs> Monday. 
I met God. <laughs> <laughs> he was a moorhead, and he fled from me. Was I supposed to pursue? Oh, just go away, you big awful dog, snuffling around on everything. I hate it here, I hate everything, and I hate you. inside my head until everything gets so it seems everything is terrible, sharp-edged and awful. I can't ever remember that there was ever anything good at all. If people look at my face, they look at my face and they see nothing. They think there are no expressions on my face just because they don't know how to look for the expressions that are on my face. They think I'm guarded, but if anyone ever truly asks me anything, I would tell them. I don't want to be all alone with my thoughts. It's like being in a dark room all the time and you have no hands and nobody even thinks to open the door for you. Sorry, I I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say any of that. I'm just not used to anybody listening. <laughs> How do you know I'm listening? Well, you may not be, but you're sitting still and you're looking at me and that's good enough. And that's close enough. I've been thinking about you a lot. You. I addressed God, and then there you were. It can't be a coincidence. Look, I don't know what a coincidence is, uh, but sometimes things just happen, you know? That's called a coincidence. Oh. But I've just been talking about me. I want to know about you. If flying doesn't make you happy, why do you do it? Happy. We talked about this. I have a terrible memory. It's why I never really learn new things. Uh, but also, I don't worry all that much, so it works for me in a way. <laughs> it's this clench knot. Uh, never mind. Tell me about why. Well, when I'm up, I'm up and up and up, and then I'm down, and then usually something hurts, and this time, Something hurts a lot. Do you need any help? You just stay right where you are. I used to imagine that if I could fly, it would make me happy to just from high above look down at things. I imagine if you could see the parameters of things, you can love them. I imagine that's why God loves everybody. And also because he doesn't have to be touched by any of us. I've been up there. It's not that great. Oh. <laughs> Look, yes? You look like a squashed grub. Like a little flat grub with its insides coming out of its outsides. I'm depressed. I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's a little flat grub with its insides coming out of its outsides. Shouldn't you do something about that? I'm talking to you. Oh, and are you feeling less depressed? I think so, yes. Oh. <laughs> Oh, oh great. Oh, just great. This day sucks. Can I come closer? Why? Because I am very big and you are very small, and it's raining. And if I stand over you, I will get all of the rain and none of it will reach you. Oh, well... And I won't eat you at all. Well, okay, but just this time. No. 
No. <laughs> I've never been this close to someone. Can't be true. I've never been this close to someone who was actually looking at me. Oh, I can close my eyes. No, don't close your eyes, please. Okay, then. I have the strangest sensation. Is it the tightness? <laughs> it's this feeling in my heart cavern, as if spring has come and all the birds are falling upwards. There you are. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean to startle you. I'm not startled. Are you Marjorie or Mallory right now? I'm in the scullery. So I'm the scullery maybe. Is this the scullery? What does it look like? <laughs> Yes, typhus, no baby. Other way around. How's the baby? I want it. <laughs> Which is preferable, typhus or a child? Well, neither is preferable. You have a point. Which is <laughs> Be a governess in London or be a governess here? London, probably. Maybe not. Which is preferable? Be eaten by wolves or being a governess? Is that a joke? Did you find it funny? Not particularly. Yeah, it wasn't a joke. <laughs> <laughs> you knew Master Branwell was dead, and you didn't say a word to me. I don't know anything. He's been dead three months. Hey, did you say so? Is he dead or isn't he? He is whatever Mistress Agatha says he is. I don't like that answer at all. I have to go scrub something. No, you just keep on scrubbing right here. No. I have to go to a place where you are not and scrub something. Yeah, do you like sweets? I'll give you a sweet. God doesn't like sweet things. Or a pretty piece of lace. Mm -hmm. I have some pretty lace I brought all the way from London. God doesn't like pretty things either. What do you want? You do this. What? You. What do I? You scrub. This is really rather. God loves women <laughs> on their knees, scrubbing. Harder. Harder. Harder than that. Is Branwell dead or alive? He's got to put your back into it. And where is the child I'm to watch? I've been here two days already. You're not doing it right. How am I not doing it right? Oh. You would do it better if you the tightness, I think. Hi, closer. This is all a little much. <coughs> oh, there you go. Now scrub. Now look here. Master Branwell is living in the attic. If you want to call that living. You want more scrub like you mean it. Whatever is he doing in the attic? You scrub better if you're pregnant, I think. Come here. Uh, no! <laughs> Why is he in the attic? Before she laid the last brick, there was a small ray of light coming through the brick wall where the hole was, and he put his face to it. He could barely reach because of the chains, but he put his mouth to it as if he could drink the sunlight. He said, Don't do this. But he knew she would do it, of course. Who? Who would do such a thing? Close your eyes. I don't want to. But I didn't ask what you wanted. I didn't ask that. I want to go home. This is your home, isn't it? This is your home now. Mallory. Yes, ma'am. What are you doing? Uh, showing Miss Vandergaard the scullery, ma'am. She does not need to see it. Yes, ma'am. You are a very idle girl, Marjorie. Go and make yourself useful elsewhere. Yes, ma'am. Did she upset you? Not at all. Well, you seem as if you might cry. I don't believe in crying. Hmm. Perhaps you would like to take a walk. Oh, 
walk. We have some matters to discuss. We're better to do so than on the moors. The fresh air, the daylight, the brisk wind. And the quicksand and the ravenous birds. You shall enjoy it all immensely. <laughs> civilization whatsoever. And does it not seem very lonely to you? It does. And does it not make you dreadfully sad? I find it comforting. A comforting? I cannot stand weakness. I cannot stand it in myself, and I cannot abide it in others. There is no weakness in the moors. When I come out here, I am surrounded by merciless strength. But uh, mightn't it turn on you? Uh, mightn't you be devoured by it? Yes. Absolutely. The maid says you ripped Master Branwell in the attic. Which maid was it? Marjorie. Mallory. Is it untrue? No, no, all true. That's horrible. Why is it horrible? Well, if he was your brother, he gambled, he deflowered virgins, he ran up considerable debt. So you chose to punish him for his ungodly uh, ways? Oh, no. One gets tired of cleaning up after others, and then one wishes to be rid of them. That's it. After father died, Branwell's indiscretions made life particularly irritating. Life became much less irritating when Branwell was in the attic. Is he dead? I left him with a loaf of bread. Of course, one loaf of bread does not last for three months. <laughs> you are very heartless and cruel. No. You see, that is a common fallacy. That strength on the parts of humans is cruelty? Out here on the moors, do you think one is coddled? No. A bird, or a fox, or a dragonfly, it must survive on sheer strength and will alone. And is one called the moors cruel? Heartless? No. Inhospitable, perhaps, but that is their nature. And only when one accepts that nature, nay, embraces it, can one truly be at home here. You are unlike anyone I have ever met. And what do you make of it? Did you truly write those letters? I did. You read my letters? Of course. Did you read them in the parlor, or did you wait until you were in your bedchamber? Oh, I chose the privacy of my bedchamber. And did they delight you? I found them very instructive. Instructive? I found them quite telling. I read into them a great deal about your character, its weaknesses, and how easily you find yourself at the mercy of the world. But pleasure, Agatha. Did you find in them any pleasure? Have you ever had a love affair, little Emily? One doesn't talk about such things. One doesn't, you're right, one does not. But here we are, and we are entirely alone. When I, when I read his letters, your letters, they made me strangely warm. Did they? A sort of a pins and needles feeling in all my extremities, even my toes. And did you like it? Oh, it was very dangerous. Did you take those letters to bed with you? Did you sleep with them against your skin? I might have. And you did it so you could dream of him? I. Yes, maybe I did. And you did. You did dream of me, and it was very nice, wasn't it? It was. And in your dreams, you came to this house. And that first night at the dinner table, he had eyes for only you. He stared at me with bright, dark eyes. He saw. And he saw you as you had never before been seen. And, and days passed, of course. One doesn't move too quickly. Until one night, I came into your room, and I stood in your door. It was a dark night, only the hint of a moon. The roughness of my stubble against your palm, against my cheek, the roughness of my hand, and everything so dark it's hard to see. And no time to stop. And I did not wish to. You did not wish to stop.
And that's why I brought you here? It doesn't matter. Of course it matters. I have brought you here to claim greatness. Greatness? My sister, as you have seen, is worthless. My brother was worse. The maid is beyond hope. But you. You will obey me, little Emily. I will. With great precision and determination and unswerving loyalty. You will do so because for the first time in your short and unremarkable life, you have been chosen above others, over others, you, and only you. Did you really consider others? I did. Oh. Master Branwell is in the attic, as you know. What you do not know is this. Although he is close to death, he is not yet dead. Marjorie brings him a thin gruel to keep him on this side of life. She moves aside the final brick, as it has not yet been mortared, and she pours that thin gruel through the hole and into his weak and waiting mouth. Why have you chosen to keep him alive? When you have a child, it will be my child. And when we are all dead, that child will remain. And our family will live forever. When I And have... that is Master Branwell's purpose. God is watching. 
judging us, and he is judging you! I have loved you long before you were famous, since you are now currently famous. I've always wanted to know your innermost thoughts and emotions. <laughs> really? Quite sincerely. Well, <laughs> what do you want to know? Why don't you kill Agatha? <laughs> Excuse me? I said, why don't you kill Agatha? <laughs> kill Agatha. <laughs> I... <laughs> Kill Agatha? You'd be the sister who killed her sister. A woman murderess. <gasps> the parson's daughter. It would be shocking and horrible, and nobody would be able to stop talking about it. You'd be infamous. Infamous? It's like famous, but more so. I know what it means. You know what the word means. I'm an author. Also, you might write about it. What it was like to kill Agatha, how you felt about it before and after. People do seem to want to know those things. They might want to ask you themselves. Oh, they might want to come here and ask you. And I should feel very strongly about my privacy. I wouldn't want any sort of that vulgar crowd in my parlor drinking my tea, asking me such intimate question, mm -hmm. how it all feels, what it all means, where I think I'm going next in life, <laughs> and do I think it's because I lacked love as a child? Oh. Which is true. I did lack love as a child. What an astute question. <laughs> that is an astute question. Did you lack love as a child? I did. I really did. <laughs> Everything here is so bleak. Mm -hmm. So loveless and bleak. And if I were to kill Agatha... Not saying I would have worked. <laughs> but if I were, I'd be sort of a splash of color, if you will. A tear in the fabric. Wrenching control of your life. Of history. History? A new chapter unrolling before your eyes. Monday. Today, everything changed. Monday, everything was cold and gray, and then all of a sudden, bam! Monday, bam! <gasps> they might write a song about it. <laughs> Sorry. There's all sorts of ballads about this type of thing. Uh, they might write a ballad about me. They might. <laughs> they would. <laughs> <laughs> what if I sort of wrote my own ballad, and that would be the one they end up singing all the time? Uh, so it'd be like I was famous, as a writer and a murderess, but also as sort of a singer-songwriter. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very likely. <laughs> this is the best day I've ever had! <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I think, who would I be if I weren't depressed? <laughs> you know? As if the thing that is making me, myself, is my own constant and unyielding misery. As if happiness is some sort of altered state in which you're no longer quite yourself. What's depressed again? <laughs> oh, that's it. Why do you want to be the squash grub again? Forget it. Say it again slower. You know? It actually doesn't matter. It doesn't? You're here, so it doesn't. That's nice. Is that nice? It's nice. Okay. <laughs> How's your leg? Still hurts. Are you sure you don't want some soup? Or maybe a blanket? I'm fine. Or I could get you something sweet. Or I could pick you some flowers. I'm perfectly fine. Or I can make you a bed out of hay and you can sleep in it. I'm okay, but thank you. I just want to help. I want to do things for you. You're already helping. Am I? Well, nothing is trying to eat me while you've been here. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you want to do things for me? You make me feel good. You told me you feel like a grub. No, that's all the times that I'm not with you. When I'm with you, I feel like the sky is much smaller, or else I am much larger, and all the things that were ready to swallow me are now possibly weaker than I am. When I'm with you, what? No, what? Say it. It's dumb. It's not. You don't even know what I was going to say. 
It's not dumb. Come on, say it. I was just going to say is that when I'm with you, oh, no, I can't. Yes, you can. <laughs> this is so stupid. I won't look at you. Okay, don't look. <laughs> when I'm with you, it feels like the space between taking off and landing, that sort of rush, the part before everything hurts. <laughs> you like that? I do. That makes me really happy. That makes me feel like something that I don't know how to describe. It's not forever, though. What do you mean? It's just for now, right? What are you talking about? <laughs> Everything is a season. The rains are a season, and the colds are a season, and the heat is a very short season. Well, everything happens, and then something else happens. The way I feel about you is not a something else happens. It's an always. Listen. You're wonderful, but you're a very large dog, and your diet generally consists of, well, things like me, and I know I'm not incredibly intelligent, and my short-term memory is, well, uh, short, <laughs> but I don't see this ending well. I would never, ever hurt you. Every time I get into the air, there's a moment in which all I feel is the wind rushing past me. Oh, it's very exciting, and it feels very good, and I believe that it is good, but even though I intend to stay up, 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 the down always hits eventually. This isn't like that at all. All I mean This is... isn't gravity. This is love. Oh, okay. Okay? <laughs> oh, forget it. <laughs> I'll, I'll get you some hay. I'll make you a nest and... I'll take care of you. And even when it rains, you'll never get wet. And even when the warm wind blows, you'll never be cold. I will stand over you and we will be so happy, okay? I guess so. No, people 
die on here all the time. People die, but people are not murdered. There's exposure. The typhus, complications. Your sister is not ailing in the slightest. Um, perhaps, uh, oh, I'll lure her into the moors. Agatha, I might say, come outside at once. And then she'll get lost on the moors. And sucked under by the quicksand. And that'll be that. You can't put that in a ballad. No. No! If you want to write a good ballad, you need a good murder. <laughs> which involves an axe, or a pick, or a dagger, or at the very least, poison. <laughs> You've thought about this. You haven't. Yes, I have. I have all the answers for when they interview me and ask me lots of questions. You have answers. Interview me. Ask me, Polidor, why did you murder your elder sister in such callous and cold blood? Polidor, why did you murder I was the one pushed to desperate straits! Desperate, I tell you! On the moors, one gets pushed to such extremity of emotion! But now, I see the error of my ways, and I repent. That's not good at all. <laughs> of your ways. You can't repent! <laughs> I can't. It's boring. Oh, nobody cares about the people who are sorry. Everyone forgets about the people who are sorry. The only people who get remembered are the people who are never sorry. Wow. Just forget it. You weren't cut out for this. No, wait. I have some scrubbing to do. I can be cut out for this. I can. I don't think so. You want to be sorry. You want to be Give it. I cannot want those things. I can be very cold and very brutal. Can you? <laughs> Interview me again. Hildegard, why did you murder your elder sister in such callous and cold blood? Because that's what I am, sir. A murderess. And how do you feel in the aftermath? Nothing. Nothing! I feel nothing. That was okay. Was it good? <laughs> it was better. Ooh, it was so good. You are going to do it, aren't you? Of course. Of course. Of course I'm going to do it. Okay, what? What? When are you going to kill her? Well, soon. Oh. Well, if you don't kill her, somebody else might just do it. What? I'm just saying. It's an opportunity. Everyone wants opportunity. If you don't take this one, well, somebody else might do it, and then you wouldn't be anything, really. You'd just be sad, old Haldi alone in the house on the moors. Sad, sad Haldi, whose sister got killed by somebody else. Which might get you a little pity, I guess. A sympathy vote? But nobody likes to think about the victims. It makes them feel sad. And then, no one would like to think about you at all. Ever. Nobody is going to murder my sister before I can. With an A, Emily, not an I. Not bad. <clears throat> yes? May I? It is very late. It is very late to be slipping into people's bedrooms. I know. Come in. Your bedroom is very... Spare. Yes? Would you have a nightcap? Do you drink? Do you find it? Unladylike? Of course. Good. <laughs> so why have you come at this hour? I had to see you. <laughs> Impulse is not the same thing as courage. Neither is liquor. A fair point. <laughs> <laughs> been unthinkable. But now it is not. 
When we were out there on the moors, everything was endless. And some might call it unforgiving, bleak, terrifying even. My eyes saw it that way at first, but as we stood there, I began to see it as you did. As a place of power, perhaps. A place that belonged to itself. And I wondered what it would be to belong to a place like that. Did you? I've moved from house to house my whole life. There's always a lady of the house who can't abide me, a gentleman who pursues me, a child who dies of something awful, and then I move on. Wherever I go, it is always the same, and I am always a stranger. What you showed me, it has a strong pull. However, however, a young girl unprotected requires certain assurances. Assurances? You understand. We'll see if I do. Go on. My child would be the heir to all of this. Is that not correct? My child, our child, will be the heir, yes. And this child would need a firm and guiding hand from its mother who must be nearby. Nearby? My own wing and my own servant. One room near the nursery, Mallory will be your servant. My own wing, and Mallory won't do. Two rooms in the west wing, Mallory will be instructed to behave better towards you. Two rooms in perpetuity, I can handle Mallory myself. In perpetuity? If I give this family an heir, I give it life. By, by my calculations, that makes me a member. I am so rarely surprised, but how enjoyable when it occurs. Thank you. I have chosen well, and you will perform satisfactorily, and that makes me content. I'd like to make you happy. I believe the word I used was content. <laughs> well, shall we shake on it? And then there is the matter of what lies between us. Excuse me? Have I surprised you again? Twice in one night is a little much. <laughs> I see the way you look at me. And when you see that I see and become cold, that does not escape my notice either. I can't imagine what you're referring to. You wanted a sweet young governess. And you summoned one. That's true. But out there on the moors, it was not just a governess you wanted. It was me. Is this conversation a necessary part of our negotiation? What assurances can you offer regarding us? <laughs> no assurances can be had in such matters. No. None that can be believed. I disagree. Are you in love, little Emily? I have never felt the way I felt when I read your letters. I have never felt that way in my whole life. And when you see me face to face, am I nothing like the man in your letters? On the contrary, you are very much like him. How is that? The man in the letters was merciless, and you are merciless. He was overly bold, and your eyes are bold. He doled out kindness sparingly, so that I was hungry for it, and this is what you do as well. I know you are doing it, and yet I still find myself willing to do almost anything for a moment of that kindness. The man in the letters was a strategist, Agatha, and that is exactly what you are. That was remarkably astute of you. You <laughs> thought I was stupid. Educated, of course, but quite stupid. <laughs> and how do you feel about me now? Come sit with me. You have made a fair number of orthographical mistakes in your letters, and I've circled them so that you may see. <laughs> <laughs> circled my mistakes? Well, if one can see one's mistakes plain in the face, one does not repeat them, does one? This is no mistake. And there it is. 
how you're looking at me. Emily. If I love you, don't mistake that for weakness. What I love most is what you have to offer. Very good. <laughs> is it? There's nothing in the world more honest and dependable than self-interest. <laughs> When the clock strikes midnight, you may go upstairs to Branwell, but until then, put your head in my lap and rest. This was left in the solarium tonight. It was left open and I saw my name. How appalling. Don't you want to know what she says about us? I seek to never concern myself with the inner life of my sister. Monday. Emily does nothing but stare at Agatha. Do I even exist? I hate Agatha. <laughs> Tuesday, if I die, I should like to come back as a rat, because their lives are much, much shorter. <laughs> Wednesday, bam! Today is the best and day. Up. All right, then sing me a lullaby. A lullaby? I am always the one singing lullabies to children who hate me. This may be my only opportunity to have one sung to me. I don't know any lullabies. I've never sung one. What you do is you think of some very simple words, and you sing them to a very simple tune. <laughs> and I went out on the moors, and I just stood there for a long time. And the quiet was a great hush, but somehow it didn't crush me. And the light was a kind of see-through, gauzy light, like a great veil. And usually that makes me feel alienated and cut off, but this time I just thought it was beautiful. A little romantic, actually. And then I thought, I would do anything for you. What are you thinking? Uh, my leg is a lot better. Oh, that's wonderful! How better? A lot better. I can stand, I can walk. Oh. Uh, what do you mean, oh? And that thing. What? It's good that you can stand and that you can walk. But if you can stand and you can walk, maybe you can walk away from me. But? Right now, I'm sitting and resting. Okay. Right now, we're both just sitting and resting. I was thinking, mm -hmm. what if I learned to fly? <laughs> to fly? Yes, what if I learned how to do it too, so that you can fly away if you wanted to, but I can go with you. And if you crash landed, I can help you. Or actually, maybe if I was with you, you wouldn't crash land. You? Why? Me? Why? I don't think you can fly, can you? Well, I've never tried. I don't think, I mean, I'm not very educated, but I don't think I've seen that before. I would do it for you, if you wanted me to. Let me think about that. Do you not want me to go with you? Do you not want me with you all the time? Well, maybe not all the time. I mean, there's privacy. I hate privacy. Everything's always already private anyways. I want to be so close to you that it feels like my skin is going to explode. <laughs> Maybe you could fly a little bit behind me sometimes so you could still see me, but I have privacy. Yeah, I guess I could do that. I don't think I can fly. Maybe you could not fly. What? Maybe you could not fly. Not 
Why? I don't know. I'm just bouncing ideas around here, but maybe you could just kind of walk from now on, <laughs> and I could walk next to you. Walk? I'm bad at walking. I limp. Or I could walk <laughs> a step or two behind you, but if you stumbled, I would catch you immediately. Wait a minute. I'm or actually, a little wagon with wheels, and I could push you, and then you wouldn't have to walk. But what if I wanted to? Well, if you wanted to walk, you could walk. But what if I wanted to fly? I just don't understand why you would want to do something that I can't do when there are so many things that you could do that I can do. Uh, unless you haven't been happy with me. Have you not been happy? That's not what I'm saying. Then I don't understand what you're saying because you, you hate flying. So if you want to do something that I can't do, that you hate, it must be because you want to get away from me. Just I am something that flies, that's all. Sorry, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be crazy. You just mean so much. You have no idea. I'm not saying you're crazy, but it freaks me out when you get intense. Sorry, I'm sorry. Well, don't be sorry, just be calm. Okay, calm, okay. I just have this nightmare where I turn my back for a second and then I feel this tug inside me somewhere, inside my heart somewhere. But when I turn around, it's too late. You're rising into the sky and I can't reach you and you won't come back down. And all I can do is watch as you get smaller and smaller and smaller until the moors have swallowed you completely and you're gone. I'm right here. Now. You're right here now. I am right here now. What about tomorrow? You're getting intense again. Sorry. I'm sorry. I don't ever want to feel the way I felt before I met you. But sometimes you will. Sometimes you will feel like that. Not if you don't fly away from me. Even if I don't fly away from you, there will be a moment in which you look at my face, and this is the face you thought you were looking at. Maybe it has an expression you don't recognize, or you'll learn something about my past that you didn't know that will make you wonder if you really know me. Then, for that time, for however long it lasts, you will feel like a squashed grub again. Then you should tell me everything about yourself now so I can learn all of your expressions and then I'll never feel that way. I don't think you're really hearing what I'm saying. Come here, sit very close to me and tell me everything. Actually, I'd like to be here, and you can be there. And maybe we can be quiet for a little bit. I can feel you drifting away. I can feel a distance between us. Why is there a distance between us? Because sometimes there is a distance. Because this is a place built on distance, and that's okay. It's horrible. I feel horrible. Hold on to me. Right, breathe, okay? But to take deep breaths, count. Breathe in the shape of a square. Calm down. I won't let it happen. What? I won't let you drift away from me. Missing tonight. Oh? 
I looked for it everywhere. I couldn't find it. You must have misplaced it. Sister? Yes, sister. I am very, very unhappy. Is that so? Yes, it is so now, and it has always been so. That doesn't make you special. <laughs> what? Everybody is very, very unhappy, Haldi. It is simply what things are. The land is bleak, and the house is large, and there is no language for all of the things lurking within us. No matter how much we write in our diaries, we are all quite unhappy. So what? Are you unhappy? I have achieved balance. Balance. I do not strive for happiness, therefore I am less unhappy. I set goals for myself, and I achieve those goals. You might try it if you weren't scribbling in your diary all the time. But I mean, aren't there other ways? And what would those other ways be? If something amazing happened, something wild or spectacular or completely unexpected. Don't you think then we'd be happy? No. And why not? Because then that event would be over. The wild, spectacular, whatever it was. Only then you would not have achieved balance. You would have achieved expectation. You would want to feel that way again and again, more and more, but you would not feel that way again and again, more and more, so you would be even more unhappy. I think I hate you. I know that. <laughs> I read your diary. You did? I did. And what did you think? I thought it was a very poor quality. You did. I'm sorry to say that I did. And why? Why did you feel that way? Oh, there was monotony, repetition, poor attention to detail, a plaintive narrator's voice that did very little to endure itself with the reader. Huh? Your spelling could improve immensely. In fact, I'm shocked that it hasn't. But to be candid, uh, it was boring. <gasps> Boring. Quite, quite boring.
She's taking a long walk on the moors. No doubt. <laughs> Are you looking for her? Uh, no, not I. Have you seen Miss Agatha? No, I can't say that I have. Uh, why? Are you looking for her? I know, no. Are you sure? I'm quite content, thank you. I have no need of either. You look different. I do. Somehow you do. Well. Isn't that something? You might read from it. But it's your diary, Mallory. You know what it says. Margaret. Excuse me? I'm Margaret when I'm an author. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Monday. Everything shall always be different now than yet. Nothing changes in this bleak land. I once saw a kitten ripped apart by savage birds. It seemed that such an awful thing would change the face of the land forever, and yet, when it was over, there was no sign that it had occurred save a little bit of fur caught in the gorse. Quite good, Margaret, really. Oh, that's very kind. Did that actually happen? Oh, <coughs> I would say it's hard to tell. I understand perfectly. You might say a scrap of fur. Scrap. It's a better word than bit. Say a little scrap of fur. Oh, that is better. The alliteration. Oh, it's very nice. <laughs> oh, what on earth has happened to the dog? It must have gone hunting, I imagine. It must have caught something. It certainly must have. Uh, sit down, Margaret. Here's a pencil. Oh. Read it again, and let us make some <laughs> judicious alterations. Monday. Everything shall always be different now, and yet, nothing ever changes. Oh, yes. That's good. That's very good. 